and wait till Patrick. Everybody, uh, thanks for, for those of you that just joined. Uh, we're, we're very happy to be uh, delivering this session for you today. Uh, so just hang tight. We'll, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. We're just going to let people uh, trickle in. But thanks for attending today. And um, yeah, we hope that you find this session very valuable and help you decide ultimately uh, which English test is right for you. Um, we'll just get started in a couple of minutes. As I said, we'll let people uh, trickle in and get comfortable and then we'll get started on our session. Uh, so we have a, a panel of experts today. We have uh, Anna, my colleague uh, from the CELPIP test. Um, she, she's a manager here and uh, yeah, she plays a big role in CELPIP's growth. And then we have uh, our Mache, our great partner um, from Summerhill. He's the director of Summerhill Online Academy and he uh, facilitates prep classes and he's a guru for preparing people to take English tests. So he's the person to, to speak to about that. So thanks to our uh, guest today. Thank oh, you. I love, I love that presentation. I do agree that Mache is a, a guru. <laughs> and Anna, a guru in, uh, in, in CELPIP as well. Um, um, Anna and I, we're just going to let a couple minutes, we're just going to wait maybe two more minutes for the um, rest of the attendees to join us. Um, we've got a, we're going to wait for everyone to join us because we have big numbers here. So we'll just let everybody kind of trickle in as uh, and, Patrick said. And in the meantime, I mean, if you would like us, if you would like to just write where you're viewing us from, where you're coming yep. from, we would love to know. And that way it also gives us an indication that you can hear us, that everything is working properly. Yeah. Um, yes, guys. Uh, so if you're just uh, joining us, there is a QA and a um, section, so you'll be able to ask us questions. Um, I was also very pleased to see a few of the questions being sent to us during the registration process. We're, we're going to try to be as complete as possible, but uh, for the first 45 minutes or so, we're going to try to explain basically um, the differences in the formats between CELPIP and IELTS. Um, I am going to prim primarily talk about IELTS, although I'll just jump in for CELPIP as well. And Anna here is going to talk primarily about CELPIP and hopefully also join in for um, IELTS as well. And uh, she's got some experience teaching both, right, Anna? Yes, I do, but I'm going to probably stick to CELPIP, but <laughs> I'm not going to mess with IELTS because I know you're, you're an expert already. <laughs> All right, we're just going to wait a couple minutes, maybe another minute or two. But basically, uh, overall, our plan for today is uh, we're going to go ahead and do the overview of both of the exams. So we're going to talk about both IELTS and CELPIP. We're going to talk about the format, specifically comparing the differences between the two formats. There is some overlay between IELTS and CELPIP. There are similarities. And because these two formats are very different, in some ways, um, they have some advantages and disadvantages. So IELTS has some advantages and CELPIP has some advantages. And we're going to be very critical, like we're going to be very um, uh, fair with both of exams and try to balance out both of these exams. Um, and towards the end of the session, we're gonna per, per, uh, have a Q&A session so this will be an opportunity for you guys to ask us some questions. And Patrick is going to help us here by me, um, uh, basically uh, managing all of the questions that are going to be jumping in. And Miche, could you help us maybe get Patrick to be the ho host? Yeah, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, no. so, he can find, so he can get the questions, yes. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly, appreciate it. There you go, yeah. Perfect. All right. But I have to also, I have to make you the co-host. So actually here, let me just go yeah. ahead and reclaim host. And then I'm going to make you my co-host. And, and I'm also going to say, uh, make co-host for Anna too. I am privileged to be a co-host today. <laughs> and I'm very happy. Um, yes, because, uh, um, Anna and I um, and Patrick, we have done a few of these 
Um, and uh, so we, we've done a few of these. Um, sometimes we've done lessons specifically on different formats, just parts of a cell tip. Um, and I, I think this is a big question because a lot of people ask me about IELTS and CELPIP, right? So a lot of students ask me, so um, as, as Patrick mentioned before, um, I'm the director of Summerhill on that academy, which is a small online boutique for preparing students for CELPIP and IELTS, primarily the IELTS general and CELPIP uh, general for, for permanent residency and other professional um, uh, um, uh, uh, designations. But in any case, I'm going to talk a little bit about IELTS. Uh, Anna's going to talk a little about CELPIP. I think we should start get uh, start going. So let's yeah. first of all talk a little bit about IELTS. So this is actually kind of a question. Uh, what's the difference between IELTS? There's actually two different IELTS tests. IELTS academic and IELTS general. Okay, these are the two tests. They both cost the same they are both the same amount of time and they have very similar formats. In fact, the IELTS academic listening and the general listening and the, so the academic and general listening and speaking for IELTS is exactly the same. You're gonna get exactly the same listening section for IELTS academic and for general. The difference between IELTS academic and general are some differences in the writing. In fact, even though it technically is different, they're all part two of, of academic write of, of IELTS writing is actually the same as academic and general. The task one is different, and the reading has the same questions, the same type of questions as in general academic, but it's a little bit different. So the general tra uh, training reading is somewhat a little bit easier. So those are the two type of um, a test, IELTS academic and IELTS general. IELTS academic is for post-secondary education, right? And some of you guys ask me, why does CELPIP not go for post-secondary education and IELTS does? IELTS, there's two kinds, IELTS general, which is for citizenship and immigration purposes. And then there's IELTS academic, which is for post-secondary. The IELTS general cannot help you for post-secondary education standards. And IELTS general is exclusively only for immigration purposes, right? Um, and okay. uh, on the so, other rest, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to quickly jump in here. <laughs> so every, many people have heard about the CELPIP test, which is the general proficiency test, but we also offer KALE which is the academic test. So Kale is more comparable to IELTS uh, academic and CELPIP. That one is comparable to the IELTS general. Now, Kale for post-secondary, so if there are any students that would like to continue their education here in Canada, specifically and exclusively in Canada, the Kale test would be a great option. Uh, it's a Canadian academic English language test. And then we have the self hip test, which is what we're going to be comparing today. We actually have two types of self hip tests. One specifically uh, that is used for permanent residency, which is called self hip general. And then we have the self hip LS. Now LS stands for listening and speaking. So when you are applying for the Canadian citizenship, then you are using, oh, I think Mathieu is going too far. <laughs> if you're doing the CELPIP LS, that's exclusively for Canadian citizenship. And it's actually just half the test. It's only the listening and speaking. So it's a great option. Plus it is less expensive. So the kale and the CELPIP general costs 280 and the other test is only 195 the one specifically for Canadian citizenship. Right. <laughs> Basically, the, but uh, the CELPIP general LS, listening and speaking, is the same as CELPIP general. 
So basically, if you already have materials for listening and speaking, it's basically the same materials as for self LS. It's just it's half the time, right? Because you don't have to do any reading or writing. Now, if you're doing uh, uh, the IELTS for citizenship, you can also do IELTS for citizenship, by the way, but you'll always have to do the four sections and you still have to pay 345 bucks. So really it doesn't make any sense. If you're just doing for Canadian citizenship, if you're doing a language a requirement for just Canadian citizenship, you should just be doing general, a self general LS because with IELTS, you have to pay more and you have to, even if you don't want, you don't need the score, you still have to do the reading and the writing during the test, which kind of is, you know, a waste of our, your time, right? So it's a little bit much. But in any case, let's go ahead and talk more specifically about the speaking of these two tests. First of all, IELTS speaking, right? So IELTS speaking is about 12 to 14 minutes. Um, it's divided into three sections. Um, and most importantly, this is actually a live interview. So um, there are two versions of the IELTS uh, test. There's the PBT or paper-based test, which you can basically write things on paper. You listen and you write things in an answer sheet and you can schedule a live interview with an examiner at, a self at an IELTS center. Or you can do the computer-based, which means you do everything on the computer, listening, reading, and writing on IELTS, and then you book the speaking through something that looks like Skype or Zoom. It's a video chat inter integrated with it. So you get to do kind of a virtual chat uh, with someone. But very importantly, it's a live, um, it's a live interview. Now, with this interview, you're basically given some questions. It's divided into three sections. In the first section, the examiner will kind of ask you some very basic questions about who you are. Uh, the topics include colors, hats, clothing, um, food, very, to very common topics. And I find that some, uh, some candidates actually have issues with this, even if they're very advanced because they find the questions to be a little bit, I wouldn't say stupid, but not relevant to their lives. So it would be questions like, do you wear hats? Why? And again, you have to, the, the trick here or the tip here is for every section for IELTS speaking, when you're doing the section, it's your responsibility to produce the language. So it's not enough to just answer the question, you have to extend the question, right? especially in section two, which is a long answer. You actually have to speak for two minutes on a topic the examiner gives you. For a three-way discussion, it's a bit challenging because it's really a kind of an interview. Um, in, in the first two sections, the examiner will actually follow a script and ask specific question. But in section three, the answers depend on your answer. So the actual examiner will interact with you and sort of interview you and question you, maybe even interrogate you in a certain sense to push you and see how well you can speak. So they will often change the topic and challenge you to extend your answer. And the section, so that, that will be the most challenging part because you're dealing with someone who is giving you an evaluation at that moment. You actually meet your examiner and that examiner interviews you and pushes you to see just how well you can possibly do by giving you follow-up questions to ask you to justify your answer, right? For the speaking, it's a little bit different, right, Anna? Yes, for the self-type speaking, I mean, one of the things to, to notice here that the speaking is from 15 to 20 minutes, and that might look overwhelming, but you are actually talking for only nine minutes. So the whole process when you're reading the information, responding, note-taking, all that is uh, basically put into the 15 to 20 minute lapse, but it actually isn't very long that you're talking. And a lot of the topics are based on day-to-day -day, uh, questions, tasks that you do. Um, if I'm asking you for advice, for example, that's one of the questions that you're going to see. Plus, you're going to have four pictures in four different tasks, and as well as uh, writing in other four tasks. So it could be about your personal experience, like 
uh, something that you did in the past, something, a, a memorable experience. Here you're describing a picture or making a prediction of something that you're seeing. This is more comparison and persuasion. You're going to compare always either two services or two items. And you are talking to somebody trying to convince them that the item that you chose is the best. And then we have the difficult situation, expressing your opinions, which we always do all the time, <laughs> constantly. And again, it's made to mimic what you're doing in a regular situation. I think the exception is this one here, describing <laughs> an unusual situation. So you will always see a very uh, weird photo but at the same time, there's always a story. So you'll see what the story is about and then be able to talk about it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll let uh, Mache sort of show you the comparisons between the two. Yeah, the speaking for IELTS and CELPIP are very different. Fundamentally, they're almost the same amount of time with IELTS being 12 to 14 minutes, but it's like an interview. So that for, from that 12 to 14 minutes, you're basically talking the whole time with the examiner uh, uh, asking you questions. But with the, uh, with the CELPIP, there's actually sometimes one minute or two minutes preparation time, and then you record each task into the computer. So you actually never see anybody else. You're actually just talking to a computer and you're recording yourself over the course of eight tasks. So you have eight tasks and you have to talk between one minute or 90 seconds for each topic. And basically you're recording yourself. Um, what's actually also interesting is that for your speaking, I believe there are at least two examiners and not four examiners for IELTS speaking. Yes, it's from three to four examiners for the right. So there's like three or four examiners. So yeah. each examiner is doing different questions and they're mixed up to make sure right. it's there. But with IELTS, it's just one examiner. So it's the decision of that one examiner mostly um, how you're doing. It's also interesting for because of IELTS speaking and uh, IELTS speaking and listening, it's the same for academic in general. So the IELTS speaking task do have some academic questions as well, but CELPIP, because it's just general, CELPIP is only general, all the topics are general and deal with common situations, everyday office situation. So, so uh, I find the questions to be a little bit easier. And somehow, some of you guys asked me, what's easier, IELTS or CELPIP? It's hard to really say, but for speaking, I find that if you're comfortable with office situations, their daily work situations, and not really um, in terms of academic topics and vocabulary, CELPIP speaking seems to be more straightforward and allows you time to prepare your answer, while with IELTS, there's no time for preparation. It's a discussion, and any delays in answering the question is it, it impacts your score negatively. I you know one of the things that uh, students sometimes ask is about the computer talking in front of a computer, but it's basically what we're doing right now because <laughs> yeah. we're talking in front of the computer. We're talking in front of the screen and you don't know who's on the other side. So it's just having the same practice, especially through COVID, many people have had to use their phones to communicate, uh, their, their tablets, their computers. So this is sort of the same feel. So mm -hmm. even if I want to use my hands, which I'm using right now, that's what I'm going to do in the test because nobody's going to watch me. Nobody's seeing me, what I'm, what I'm doing. So it's just trying to have that type of communication and not being nervous because the other person is right in front of you and you know that person is rating you. So sometimes the anxiety is taken off. So it really <laughs> depends. And it is a personal choice as well. Yeah, I personally like to get things over with, but with files, <laughs> you have to do the listening, reading, then writing, and then you have to wait and for, the, for, your, for your interview. And sometimes you have to wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, you have to wait in the hallway in a line and get asked to be called in into the office sitting down. Um, it, it can be a little bit um, unnerving. But um, yeah, and, and uh, so again, it, it depends, right? And sometimes you have to book the speaking on a different day. That's another point. That is, that's with, true. <laughs> with self, if you do it all right away, 
it comes one right sitting. away. You don't have to wait in one sitting, but with self it's speaking, sometimes you have to book it for another day. So you might be doing your listening, reading, and writing on, on Saturday, and then book the right of speaking on Sunday. So it depends on, on me. Some people just want to say, oh, I just want to be there only for writing. I don't mind taking an extra, um, you know, commute to go there and spend another extra day just to do the speaking, you know, to get to focus on it. Um, I, th that's for all for speaking for um, IELTS and Kale and, and Selpip, uh, I mean. Um, let's get to the writing part. The writing is really interesting. That's the big point here. IELTS, IELTS basically is divided into, this is where it's different for IELTS academic in general. Now, the big difference between IELTS academic in general is writing task one. There are two sections for IELTS writing, and there are two sections for IELTS Selpip. Uh, sorry, for self-it writing. So there are two sections for self-it, two sections for, I, uh, for IELTS in terms of writing. Now, there's a big difference between um, um, the IELTS general and academic task one um, because the task one for um, IELTS is basically, in general, it's a letter. It's an email. You basically write an email. But for the academic, you have charts, graphs, bar charts, processes. In fact, there are four separate tasks for IELTS. There's graphs, there's charts, bar charts, proportions, there are uh, processes. So there's a lot of vocabulary you have to actually review to prepare for this. So, um, but again, for IELTS general, if you're taking this test for a uh, permanent residency or citizenship in Canada, it's basically the same. If I gave you an IELTS or self writing task one, IELTS general or self writing task one, you'll be very hard pressed to see any difference. It's basically the same. Yeah. Any uh, question, any, anything you'd like to add for um, self writing task one, Anna? No, I, I feel the same. It's very, it's comparable. Both of them are very similar, whether you're writing a letter or writing an email, it's pretty much the same. If I see these questions side by side, I actually don't see any difference. It's basically it gives you a prompt, gives you three bullets, things you should always remember. If you're doing IELTS or self it make sure you extend every bullet, write the three bullets in the same order as you, as you see them, and use proper tone. Are you going to be polite? Are you going to be formal? Are you going to be informal? Right? So um, for um, IELTS academic writing task one, and writing tasks, uh, or the writing tasks are very different. But for IELTS academic in general, writing task two is basically the same. I've seen some academic and general writing tasks too, and they're still just essays. I, I, I would be very hard pressed for anyone to see the difference between an academic writing task two and a general writing task two for IELTS. They're basically essays and they're 250 words. Um, and I believe that in self it's 150 words for both task one and task two. For, self, for IELTS, 150 words for task one, 250 words for task two. And the, the, the writing part two is actually really, really tricky because there's are, you need to learn three different essay formats at least, right? You have to, and you have to choose the correct format. Because if you do not choose the right format for the right question, you're not going to get the full score, right? Again, there's almost no difference between IELTS academic and general and the criteria for evaluating the general and academic tasks is basically the same. It is in fact the same. So when the examiners are looking at a writing task to academic in general, they're using the same rubrics, the same standards, the exactly the same standards, Right, and so in the general, the topics are more general, I guess, but they're phrased in the certain way, same way as the academic topics. And still you have to navigate a, uh, th this playing field of trying to choose the right format for the essay, right? For CELPIP, um, it's different, right? It's, 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 for writing task two, it's different, isn't it? Yes, here you have a survey. So you're choosing between two options and you will always have an option. There isn't a perfect response for that. You can choose either option A or option B. 
And the situation is always about the community. So in your community, they are going to have um, uh, either a new park or a mall. So which would you prefer, a park or a mall? And then you would need to explain. And there are certain ways that Mache will, ex will explain it or how you can respond to that. Or it could be in a workplace. And in that workplace, they want to open up a new gym or um, an eatery place or, you know, there are different options that they'll give you. But again, you always have option A and option B. And it's between 150 to 200 words. Right, as, as Anna mentioned with the IELTS acad uh, academic and general writing task too, you have about 250 words, which you have to organize in a specific structure based on the actual question. And they're asking you for your opinion about these topics. But for writing task two, um, FELPIT, you already have the two options. It's option A and B, and then you just have to answer it. And what I actually like is that in FELPIT writing task two, not only is it shorter, you're basically going to use only two kinds of formats, just two kinds of formats. And the first format type A, you're gonna be using that 90% of the time. The questions are not, definitely not as tricky as in the IELTS question. And the IELTS writing task too, basically it is meant to be tricky because it's basically academic in general is the same, right? Also in writing task two self, if it's 150 words for both task one, and task two, and there are no academic topics. So I would say the big difference between CELPIP and IELTS writing is the kind of structure that you have to choose. The CELPIP is shorter and it's a limited structure. You're basically gonna write just one kind of essay, type A with an introduction, two body paragraphs that support either you're choosing A or B as those two options. But with IELTS, you have to craft an essay. So it takes a long time actually to practice um, answering a writing task to essay with a thesis statement and you have to choose the right format because if you do not choose the right format for the right answer for the right question, you're not going to succeed in, ta in this task. Anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I think one of the things that really differentiates between the two is that CELPIP has the spell check, which isn't available in the other tests. So spell check, if you put quit or quiet and you wanted to put a different word, it's going to be underlined in red. And once you click on the word, you will have options to choose from. So sometimes because we're typing, we do make errors. So it's always best to double check the information and also see which lines have been underlined and choose the right word. I, I am ashamed here to say that even though I've been an English teacher for almost 20 years now, my God, a long time I've been teaching English. Um, I, my grammar is pretty good. My spelling hasn't gotten actually degraded over time because of so many technological devices that we have. We have spell check on our phones, in our computers. When we, when we write emails, we have spell check everywhere. So I, I do tend to make some spelling mistakes sometimes. And so spell check, big game changer, right? Spell check, there's a spell check in cell, but no spec spell check for IELTS general or academic, right? Okay, so there we go. Let's move on to the next point, reading, because we want to answer some questions too. For the IELTS reading, my goodness. So IELTS academic and general reading, that, there it's going to be different. So with the, um, with the well, basically with the, um, with the IELTS reading, it's 60 minutes, right? And so there are two types. If you're doing the, um, if you're, you're basically doing the academic, you're doing three, 2000 word passages. So you're you're doing three, about two page or 2000 word reading passages. That's uh, that's a lot of words, right? That's uh, that's six 6,000 words of reading that you're basically doing. With the um, um, general, it's a little shorter. You're doing four one page passages, which are between 6, 600 and 1000 words. And then one, two page, 2,000 word passage for the general, which basically looks the same as the academic. So basically with, with, the, with the IELTS um, reading, the last sec, there's three sections. The general two, the first two sections of the general are split into four different passages. 
And then the last passage for the general, it's the same as academic. But for the academic, there are four, three readings and they're all very long readings, right? Now, general reading is a little bit easier, but you actually have to score a higher score for accuracy to get the same band as for academic. So for, if you're doing academic IELTS, you need to score 35 out of four, uh, you, get, you, you have to score 30 out of 40 to get a band seven, which is uh, basically the score for permanent minimum score for permanent residency and also entrance to post-secondary education. But for general IELTS, you have to get 35 out of 40 to get the same score. So it's much, much uh, more accurate. You can make fewer mistakes. Another big point about IELTS reading, and this is a big point, there are 14 separate kinds of questions, separate different kinds of questions, multiple choice, fill in the blank, matching headings, um, match identifying writer's views, identifying information, headings, and they're very tricky. Um, I find that identifying the writer's views and claims is one of the most difficult sections. In fact, here I got an example. These are called the yes, no, not given questions. So um, as an example to, uh, to explain how this works, let's take a look here. With its ticking heartbeat, the mechanical wristwatch is alive and never felt better. And for most people, the very definition of a luxury watch is a Rolex. It has a mystical aura of high fashion, high quality, and high price. It is the most popular high-end watch with an estimated 750,000 sold annually and even more changing hands each year in a second-hand market. Based on that information, would these sentences be no, we don't know, this is not possible. Yes, the, uh, the author agrees with this or not given, we're not sure if the author agrees or disagrees. So, Patrick, let me tease you. More people buy Rolex watches new than secondhand. Would this be yes, no, or not given based on the above information? Let's tease Patrick a little bit. Um, well, it says even more changing hands every year secondhand. So this would be uh, no. Yeah, that would be a no. Patrick's got this. And it says, watches are as popular now as they have ever been. Uh, let's see. Doesn't, it doesn't really say, I don't think. Well, there is something there at the beginning. It says that mechanical wristwatch is alive and never felt better. Oh, Does yeah. that give us the indication that it still continues to be popular? <laughs> I guess so, because technically yeah. that's yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And the is less expensive than it used to be. Uh, they're not talking about prices here, so I would say not given. Exactly. These yeah. are tricky. All right? Like, yeah, you really have to focus on the vocabulary because it sort of hints at it, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's a slightly tricky. <laughs> You're also doing these questions and finding the information in a 2,000 word reading. So it's not that easy, right? In most cases for the academic, right? The other one is the heading. This is very difficult. Um, it's kind of similar to um, um, self reading task three. Uh, but basically you have these labeled paragraphs and then you have these headings, which are the topics of each body paragraph and you just label them. They're very similar, but basically that's the format of the IELTS. What about self -ib? Let's take you to, take you to uh, Anna here. <laughs> well, to start off, the amount of time that you are taking can be up to, up to 60 minutes, but if you are a fast reader, you respond to the questions quicker, you can, you can finish it and then continue with the next uh, part of the test. So one of the benefits of taking this test, even though it says it is three hours long, it doesn't really mean that you are going to take three hours to do the test. Because if I do the listening section and I respond faster, I do the reading and I respond faster, We've seen many people that have finished in two and a half hours, two hours, and even one and a half hours the test. So there are 
quite some differences and the same goes with the reading section. Here you have multiple choice questions and drop down menu, which can be different from the other test because in the other test, if it's fill in the blank, sometimes they'll be very specific. They might say no more than one word or include two words. And that might make it a little bit more difficult, but here it, you just, choose one response out of four options. So it really makes it a lot easier for people to do. Yeah, I would say uh, that's a big difference. Like, as I mentioned before with uh, IELTS, you have 14, you have basically 14 different kinds of questions. You have to learn how to solve each of those 14 different kinds of questions. You have to study each kind of question because you might see it. With CELPIP, there are only two questions a multiple choice question and a matching questions in writing task three. Those are the only kinds of questions in CELPIP, right? And so, so CELPIP taps task one, you have an email, it's about 350 words and 11 questions. Then for, and you have 11 minutes to complete it. It's a lot of skimming and scanning. For reading task two, it's not, um, it's usually like an email or a pamphlet right? It's uh, short, like it, it, it's, it's, and again, you have a few questions there. Reading task three, you have a matching question similar to the headings. Again, it's still about 350 words. And task four, um, task four is almost the same as reading task one. The only difference is reading task four and task one for CELPIP. It's an email versus an article, but it's the same amount of words, right? And another so, thing is that yeah. the language is Canadian English. So if you're here in Canada, you're reading and listening to Canadian English, the language will be sometimes simpler for many people to use. So there's not a lot of international language usage here. Yeah, for IELTS general, the language in the first two sections, which means the first four articles is quite general. But again, when you get to reading task three, it's an academic, it's an art academic article. There's no difference between the academic and general reading task three. It just, I have, I've looked at it many times. The time is very different, 60 minutes versus 43 minutes. Word count is huge. Um, it's approximately 3,500. I, I should be saying here 6,000 words. I'm sorry, 6,000 words because for the, uh, for, for the, Oh, sorry, for the general, at least, for IELTS general, about, about 3,000 to 400 words. For IELTS academic, it is 400 words, uh, 6,000 6, 6, words. But uh, for the, for the even for the uh, um, IELTS general, it's about 3,500 to 4,000 words, minimum, knowing that the last section will be 2,000 words alone, right? But it's uh, maximum 2,000 words in total that you have to read for, for CELPIP. Right. Um, again, 14 different types of questions versus just two for self. -tip. It's pretty much all multiple choice. Right. And for IELTS reading, you have a mix of academic and general topics for uh, for self. -tip, it's only general topics. And again, very good point there. I, I missed that. Um, um, self is all Canadian pronunciation. It's all Canadian vocabulary, Canadian context. IELTS is more international because IELTS, one of the advantages is it's, it's useful for um, a permanent residency in Australia, New Zealand, um, in the uh, United States, in England, in Canada, in, in, in Ireland. But then the pronunciation right, I mean, and, and the vocabulary is a little bit different. So um, there, there are going to be some vocabulary that are going to be more British than Canadian, not very North American, right? Anything else we'd like to add for this one, um, Anna? No, me? you've covered it all now. <laughs> okay, let's move quickly because we're a little bit behind. Let's yeah. talk about listening. As I mentioned before, the IELTS academic listening and speaking are exactly the same. The only difference is academic reading and writing and general training reading and writing. So with the IELTS are listening, you, it's about 30 minutes. So if it's paper-based, if it's paper-based, if you're listening to a speaker, it's basically 30 minutes and then you have 10 minutes to transfer the answers into the answer sheet. If you're doing this online, you have a little bit more because you're answering the question as you're going. You don't have to transfer the answers. You put them straight in the computers. But there are 40 questions in total. 
which is actually the same for, I believe, CELPIP. Is it 38 or is it 40? Uh, it's 38 questions it's 38 in total. Questions. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, with just like in reading, in reading, you have 14 different kinds of questions. In IELTS, again, you have tons of different kinds of questions, like multiple points is just one of them. For um, for uh, cell pip listening, it's only multiple choice, right? It's just multiple choice. But for I believe, but for IELTS listening, it's uh, basically there are graphs, there are charts, there are maps, there are um, diagrams, flow charts, short answer questions. You have to actually answer what you hear. You don't have to choose. And for but for um, uh, for uh, uh, cell pip, there are actually mo all, all multiple choice answers. You don't have to write anything from yourself, but if for, for IELTS, you have to actually uh, listen and write the right words. Big point here, no taking notes. For IELTS listening, you have to answer the question as you listen or you'll miss the answer, right? Which is different for IELTS, uh, sorry, for self-pip listening, right? So, um, Anna, would you like to talk a little bit about self-pip listening? Yeah, just for self-pip listening, um, here you have six sections, but the way it's done is very different than the, than the other test. So everything will be listening. The questions will be asked through the audio as well. So it does take a little bit longer, but it's because you're listening constantly. And one of the, the things that I would recommend if you do take this test is to practice note taking because you will have the opportunity just to listen. You don't have to be looking at the questions and trying to figure out which one they're talking about. First, listen to the audio, write down the notes, understand what they're saying, and then after the questions will come. So for some people that makes it less stressful, but it really depends again individually what you would prefer to do. But that way you understand what the topic is about, who the people are that are talking, what they're talking about, what they're saying, what the situation is. And then you're just writing down and you don't have to write perfect sentences. You can write just words, uh, abbreviations, anything just to help you to remember. Yeah, so the first parts, it's basically the same kind of parts. You're going to hear one question at a time, and you have to choose a multiple choice answer after hearing one of the questions. And from four to six, once again, you're going to hear everything, right? And then you're going to pull the answer down uh, uh, through the pull down menu. The first three sections are all the same. There are two, two people talking, a man and a woman. And then you have one news article which is kind of like a story then you actually have a short video you get to watch and then you actually do another point which is listening to viewpoints which is kind of like uh uh something you'd hear on the radio like a podcast on the radio but yeah. big points here for listening and unless you want to, and i would really add this taking notes for the for, for self it is part of this and and i know that one of the participants here they sent us a question in the actual registration process i want to answer this the question was what happens if you're not good at memorization and not good at taking notes for self it my answer is you need to get better at taking notes you cannot get away with not taking notes for self -it. You can usually get away with not taking notes for the first three sections because they're actually really easy. It's really easy to get like no mistakes at all in the first three sections. They're really, really easy. But, but you must learn to take notes. It's a skill. It is an essential skill. So fundamentally, if you don't like taking notes, you can just do IELTS where you don't have to do notes. But then you have to answer the question as you as you listen, because you'll not hear it again. And also, um, you you have to learn 14 different kinds of question types, like flow charts and graphs. With the Celtic, you do need to take notes, but you only have to deal with multiple choice answers. So you don't have to remember what word to write. And also, by the way, every time you write an IELTS answer and the spelling is wrong for listening, the answer is wrong. So you actually have to watch for your spelling and IELTS listening as well. But with CELPIP, there's no spell check involved because it's only multiple choice. 
Um, Anna, would you like to add anything else? I think the, the greatest thing I want to say here, because I, I keep reiterating this, but the Canadian accent. Right. So it will be Canadian vocabulary, Canadian accents, or North American accents, things that you're used to listening to already. So it doesn't make it too difficult if you're listening to a different accent, maybe an Australian accent or a British accent, which can be challenging for some people. But if you're already used to the North American accent style, then it does make it a little bit easier for many people to do that test. But again, personal choice. <laughs> yeah. um, I would like to also add that in terms of accents, right? You're going to hear many different accents in the, cell, in the IELTS listening, including a New Zealand accent, Australian accent, Irish accent, um, uh, a, a British accent, North American accent. And by the way, because you're doing this test for the speaking section, I should add, if you're, because the speaking section is done by an IELTS examiner, the IELTS examiner may have a New Zealand accent, an, uh, accent, an Australian accent. They might even have a, let's say, um, an Indian accent or, you know, a, a, an Asian accent or, you know, a Latin American accent, because for IELTS, accent does not affect your score, but also does not affect the kind of examiner you're gonna have. And, and truthfully, I have found some um, uh, uh, English uh, test takers that took IELTS and they did an IELTS with a, let's say, Indian examiner, and they were not familiar with the accent and found it a little bit difficult. Not everyone can do that. There's an advantage to that, of course, but for self-help listening and speaking, anything that you're going to hear for IELTS, it's always going to be a Canadian accent, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so I just want to sum up a little bit before we get to the Q&A session, which is the main meat and potatoes of this presentation. We want to add, add, answer your questions, guys. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the IELTS advantages and disadvantages. IELTS does have many advantages. First of all, it's internationally accepted in all speaking countries in the world. So you can use it for PR in uh, UK, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, right? But okay, this is also nice thing about this though is that uh, um, if you're doing, let's say IELTS for your PR in Canada or for, for an immigration program in Canada, the Canadian government actually will see that maybe you're trying for different places. Like maybe you're, you're thinking, maybe I want to live in Canada, but maybe I want to live in the United States or Australia. So when you're doing self it for your PR purposes, it kind of shows the government you're really serious about living in Canada and not just looking at different programs. This is especially important for um, post-secondary institutions because if you're doing IELTS academic for post-secondary institutions, and it's a university in Canada, even a small university in Canada or a college in Canada, they see you're doing self, they, they know that you wanna to choose to be in Canada. And the, you know, and they, but, but if you're doing IELTS, maybe you already did an application in the United States or Australia. So, you know, is it worth the processing time just because you might be rejecting it? That's one of the things I wanna say. But if you like paper textbooks, IELTS is the way to go because all the work, all the materials for studying for IELTS are computer based. It's kind of nice because the self is only computer based, while the IELTS is paper based and computer based. So if you want to do a paper based IELTS, it's great. There's so many books there in the library, right? But with the but but then again, you have to use a CD or something. You have to you know you have to sort of set it up for yourself. With IELTS preparation materials, it's all computer-based, and it basically is a perfect simulation of the exam you actually would do at a center, right? Um, it's also a real good, good point. If you're doing IELTS academic, it's easy to switch to IELTS general because it's so similar, right? IELTS academic in general is so similar. This, the disadvantages for IELTS, I would say, um, it's the writing is very challenging. For IELTS academic in general, especially writing task two, it is challenging. I spent the last 15 years teaching IELTS writing 
And I must say, it is a very challenging thing to teach students how to formulate an essay for writing task two IELTS, but for self, it's much easier. Um, and again, it's a lot of practice uh, for, for reading and listening, a lot more than for, for CELPIC. That's what I'm gonna say, right? Again, big, big advantage for IELTS, international, more international. CELPIC is purely Canadian. Anna, would you like to add some points here for CELPIC? Well, yes, I think what you what you mentioned was correct. It is a Canadian test, and that means that you're solely doing it for Canada. So if it's either for permanent residency or if you do the LS test for citizenship, then that means you're you're thinking about just living here, staying here permanently in Canada. Benefits, obviously, is that they're general topics, everyday topics. They really focus on what you do on a daily basis. And we do have mock tests that are available for free. There are two free tests. You just go to the website where it says free resources and you can start practicing today. So nice and easy. And I do understand that with the other tests, there's a lot of resources available, but sometimes that can become overwhelming because there's too much information. And then you don't know what is great to practice with because there's too much information. But if you are going to our website, you are going to the exact source. This is where you're going to find all the information. You're going to find a lot of resources, anything that you know it's coming from us, from the direct company. But with IELTS, there's <laughs> many things to choose from and that could be challenging. And that maybe sometimes is where you're looking for, for a tutoring class because you don't know how to practice or you need more practice. So it, it really depends. And then, as you mentioned, like the vocabulary, the pronunciation, spell check, all that is really important for some people. And yes, again, because it's Canadian, you're not thinking about traveling elsewhere. But again, you do have choices. And if you decide to take the one for post-secondary for the tail test, again, that's just a Canadian test. And at least people know that you are serious about staying here and studying here as well. I think one of the disadvantages is that you don't have the option of paper and computer. This is all done on computer. And many times nowadays, especially nowadays, we're using so many devices and they're all like a computer. They're all like a tablet, a phone. You're always using these type of devices and it does become helpful for many people. But if you're not as proficient in using these types of devices, then it may become a little bit more difficult, but that, you know, really is up to you. Yeah, I just uh, added here because in my slide here, when you're doing your CELPIP, you do have to do it in CELPIP Center for now. I believe uh, Prometrics is working on a version you can do at home with IELTS you can do at home. Um, I do always recommend to all my students to do their, their test, whether it's IELTS, self or Kale, in a test center, though, because if you do it in a test center, center there, are more, there are fewer things that can go wrong with your computer system, your internet, your connection. And if, if something goes wrong with your connection at home, it's your fault, mm -hmm. right? I um, just want to do a few things side by side just to summarize um, self it and uh, basically you can complete the exam, the whole exam early. You don't have to wait for these sections to, to finish. You can go straight away and complete it in a shorter amount of time. You do not need to schedule a separate test. It's all together because it's all computer. There are Canadian vocabulary, Canadian pronunciation, Canadian, Canadian accent uh, for the speaking and for the listening. Um, you get editing tools, including spell check, which is great for CELPIP. And again, all the topics and all four sections are non-academic. There are no academic topics here. For IELTS, you do have to wait to complete each section before you go. So as Anna mentioned, sometimes you get the records of finishing your CELPIP in, in, in like one and a half hours. With IELTS, it is the full three hours that you're doing. And sometimes you have to wait a little bit longer than that. Sometimes you're there all day as you're waiting for the speaking examiner or if the speaking examiner's late or there's some issues, right? Because it's a, it's, it's a human component that can always go wrong. And again, 
Um, you have to book the speaking separately, and sometimes it's on a different day. There's more British vocabulary and international accents. There's almost no difference between the IELTS and the academic, right? And because they're so similar. Just a little point here, because we did talk about IELTS and uh, and, 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 and CELPIP, but some of you guys asked me about the IELTS academic. There is also a KAIL, which is what Paragon or Pro Prometrics provides. Um, and uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to both. But again, I would say the big advantage for Kale is that Canadian universities like it a lot more. Uh, that's because it shows your commitment. So it doesn't matter for your PR, IELTS or, or, or CELPIP, they really don't, uh, the government won't care so much. But for universities, they do care, uh, they care a little bit more, they prefer a little bit more to give you a letter of acceptance to a Canadian university, because you know you're serious about the Canadian market, which means that those universities don't have as many international competitors. So they know, ah, okay, this guy really wants to study in Canada. They're not, they didn't do an, an application in the United States and Australia or UK. They're not just trying to weigh different options. Um, big, big point I just want to add before we get to the Q&A for the regulated Canadian immigration consultants. Some of you want to become regulated Canadian immigration consultants. A lot of my clients at Summerhill Nut Academy are preparing for CELPIP and they've been preparing for IELTS and CALE to meet their language proficiency um, for entrance to, for the entrance exam. So if you want to become a regulated Canadian immigration con consultant and want to write the entrance to practice exam, you have to meet the language requirements. So there is no IELTS general option. So um, RCIC or the or, uh, CRIC, right? RCIC, they only accept IELTS academic, not general, but they also accept CELPIP, which is great. It looks like it's a higher score, but uh, basically this is CLB nine score. So IELTS seven academic is um, um, CLB seven, it's a CLB nine. The CELPIP test is basically based on the Canadian language benchmarks. So IELTS seven is CLB seven, IELTS nine is CLB nine. Right. Um, by the way, listening eight, it means you can only make three wrong in IELTS listening. So it's a little bit more difficult. I always advise for self of general for this purpose, because, again, you don't need to do academic topics. It's a lot more straightforward. So without any further ado, it's time for a and a Right. All right. Great <laughs> job. Uh, it's both of you. So we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, so let's see here. So I'll just uh, go through them one by one. But uh, basically, Margie asked early on if uh, English test scores expire. So yeah, basically for CELPIP, um, I believe the same for, for IELTS as well. Uh, they're valid for two years from the test date. Um, so yeah, so from the time you took the test for two years, it's, it's valid. Um, it's good to keep extra copies of your results too. Uh, because sometimes for citizenship, um, not immigration, but for citizenship, the government might accept a, a, a test that was taken a little bit longer than that. But typically, it's valid for two years, uh, your results from the time you took the test. And that's for same for IELTS and CELPIP. I got a question from Rick here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to try to answer this live if that works. Um, um, so would your Caribbean accent work against you? Absolutely not. No, it would not work against you. Again, IELTS and CELPIP both do not find that an accent um, impedes the English level, right? So there's an accent is not part of the evaluation. The only thing about accent here is for your purpose. If you're, if you're co comfortable with, a, with, let's say, a British accent, then or and like different kinds of accents as a candidate, that's fine. The only thing, the other the only thing about accents I want to point out here is that when you're doing CELPIB as a candidate, you can always expect a North American accent, but your accent does not does not in, have any effect on your score in both IELTS or CELPIB speaking. 
Yeah, and I would just add, I guess, speak a little bit slower because when we tend to get nervous, we tend to speak quicker. So just try to speak as slower, a little bit slower and, and as clearly as you can and you'll be fine. Not in IELTS though. <laughs> One thing about speaking okay. in IELTS, do not speak slowly in IELTS. Actually, okay. if you speak slowly, you get a lower score. You have to sound natural. Gotcha. The only, I'm just going to correct their pattern because I don't yeah, want to no, please start do, please speaking do. slowly because yeah. we're most definitely you're going to get a lower score. Definitely in IELTS. I say this, I've worked as an IELTS examiner for speaking and writing for many years. This is something that's there. You cannot speak slowly in IELTS. Okay. Yeah. No, well, we're not saying to speak too slowly either. <laughs> yeah. It's just more to speak at a natural pace when you're having a conversation with somebody, but not rushing it. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. More questions, guys. All right. Uh, so we just had uh, Margie asked, uh, can you combine your basically your scores from CELPIP and IELTS or TAIL? to meet your score requirement? No, you cannot. No. Um, and so um, for one exception would be um, for the RCIC entrance to practice, you can combine two IELTS or two CELPIP scores, okay? okay. But you can't combine IELTS and, and CELPIP or KALE and CELPIP. You cannot combine or can test, right? You, you can combine any two IELTS or any two CELPIP scores for your um, immigration, uh, re re regulated Canadian immigration consultant entrance to practice exam, but not for permanent residency. And one thing to note here is that, let's say in one section you didn't get the score you needed, you cannot just retake that section. You have to do the full test over again, whether it's CELPIP, or the other test, it's the same thing. You need to, you'll need to do it again. So, Patrick, I think you have a question from Rick. Um, I think this is for you. Um, how long is a time frame for a CELPIP exam? How how quickly do you get the answers for your score back from CELPIP? So you get the results in uh, four to five calendar days. So not business days. Uh, four to five calendar days. Um, and then basically your results will be on the CELPIP website. So you have to sign in at CELPIP.ca into your account and you're, you can actually download your score report um, as a PDF onto your computer and then submit uh, the, 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 the results online for immigration or citizenship. So um, as of right now, everybody's getting their online score report in their CELPIP account. Um, we would only mail you the physical score report if you order one. So if you request it specifically, uh, but the online uh, score report that you can download onto your computer is valid by the Canadian government to apply for citizenship or immigration online. So it's a little bit more convenient. You don't have to wait for a physical report in the mail. Uh, you can just submit your results online and um, check them online from your self account. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Any other yeah. questions now? Uh, let's see here. So we got um, Rick just asked uh, previously uh, if CELPIP is only computer-based. Um, yes, right? CELPIP is only computer-based. Yeah. But, but you, is there a paper-based version of um, CELPIP on the way? A paper-based version? No. But if there is somebody that requires it to be paper-based for uh, medical purposes, they're not able to use a computer for any issues that they may have, then they would need to let us know ahead of time that they would have to contact info at cellpip.ca so that they can get that information. Because we do try to help anyone who might have any medical um, issues. So if they need more time, if there's something that is required, just let us know ahead of time and then we'll try to accommodate uh, that person. And I think, uh, Patrick, I don't know if I mentioned the right information, but I know that there has to be some accommodations done. Right. This is a common question. I got one of these questions, too, about accommodations. Um, if you want to be accommodated, and you can, whether you have a learning uh, exceptionality or, or you, you need more time for some reason, um, is, is it possible to get accommodated? And if so, um, how long 
does it take? Um, sorry, if I wanted to, for example, if I want to book a, an IELTS exam for next week, I basically can. But if I want an accommodation, how long do I have to wait in order to have my, my test examined uh, uh, accommodated? Do I need an extra week, two weeks, a month? Yeah, so basically uh, for CellPIP or Kale, you do have to uh, fill out an accommodations request form. So that's on the CellPIP website. There's a tab called Policies and Forms. Um, so keep in mind, you would not register for a regular test sitting because the regular test sittings will not include accommodations. So you're going to have to contact us uh, privately or directly and fill out the request form, which would include a medical medical documentation uh, with your doctor's uh, recommendations on what kind of accommodations you would need for the test. And uh, basically, you have to submit the form um, at least two months in advance of like you'll you'll get a test date. You can expect to get a test date about two months from the time you submit the special accommodations request form. So um, yeah, and then on the form, it tells you the email that you have to send the form to, but it does have to be supported with uh, medical documentation. And um, we look at them case by case and we try to work with you to find a solution and, and, and you know, help you feel the most comfortable that you can while you're taking self or kale. Great. Any more questions that we got here? I was just going to bring up one thing. So we do have a promotion right now that um, anybody that opens a bank account with National Bank of Canada, if you've been in Canada five years or less, um, you will get $280 cash back, which you could put towards uh, your self and for kale test. So that'll cover most of the test uh, minus the tax. So there is a uh, promotional link that I'll send in the chat here. But oh. basically... Yeah, you open up your account with National Bank, you make your first trans uh, transaction, and then you would get the $280 cash back, uh, which could help you uh, pay for your English test. Because I know, you know, uh, Toronto and, and Canada is expensive. Uh, life is expensive. So this will kind of help you and maybe cover most of your English test fee. So I'll just put the link in the chat. So feel free. Um, on the link, it has the uh, National Bank's contact information if you want to get in touch with them to see how to take advantage of this offer. But, um, um, I just like I, I adds, um, uh, since we're, we're talking about promotions here, um, there are there's some materials that that our uh, participants are getting, whether they're they, they, to, tonight, right? Yes, so you will be getting um, the material for self-hip reading and writing. It's a self-hip accelerate, which are instructional videos. There's over 50 instructional videos to help you step-by-step -step to help you practice for this. So absolutely. And it's one of my favorites. I've used that in a classroom so many times and I know students love it. So you will be getting a voucher code for that. Um, I don't know if that's, I, it will go directly to you, Maché, and I think maybe Patrick might be able to share it here. I, I, if you can, if not, you will receive it directly uh, by email after this presentation. Yeah, I will be sending an email to everyone. And again, everyone will receive an email after this, plus a link to the video for this. So you'll be able to see a video of this. Um, um, and, and share it with anyone that, that also has uh, questions about this. But uh, as we're kind of rolling to the end, I would just like to say that, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Anna and uh, Patrick for joining me tonight. Um, um, wait, we do have something more here. Oh, there, that, I think that's a question for Patrick there. Maybe you can answer there, but oh, uh, yeah, perfect. Um, but uh, I just like to say that uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me today. Um, Anna and Patrick actually have done many of these uh, presentations and we've done some very useful presentations that give you uh, a, a good preparation for the format for self speaking and writing, reading and listening. So we've actually, today we kind of talked about generally about these sections, but uh, we do have videos available. Um, on YouTube under the official Summerhill Online Academy um, uh, YouTube channel. So you can see this video and previous workshops and uh, presentations that we've done together with Anna and Patrick. 
and to, to get a lot more helpful tips and techniques about all sections of CELPIP. Um, so, um, so you can subscribe. Now I have done the CELPIP. I am also a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. And so I actually had to choose whether to do IELTS or CELPIP. I have done the CELPIP. I honestly found it to be easy. I did get a maximum score in this particular test. So I did do a lot of these techniques and try to study. Again, it, it makes sense because I've been teaching uh, CELPIP and IELTS for almost 20 years. But I have designed a course with all of those strategies involved. Um, this is a monthly course. So every month I have a group CELPIP course, which is quite conveniently priced at only $650 for a full four weeks or 40 hours, four, four weeks or 40 hours of CELPIP preparation. And in that course, we go over the schedule uh, describing uh, and, and basically training all of the skills and, and techniques necessary to get the highest possible score in CELPIP in listening, reading, and writing. It's a small group course with uh, between six and uh, 12 students in each group class. I do teach this course, so um, you are most welcome to join the course. The next course begins August 1st and will finish August 29th for four consecutive weeks. Um, I'm going to give uh, the room a one final chance for any questions. And we will be getting together very soon on August 17th. We're going to do an IG live, so an Instagram live. So if you want to join us, you can go to Summerhill Online Academy. Do you have your Instagram live there as well? Um, I have, um, I, I believe I will have it on, uh, on the, my, my Instagram as well. So you can find me on uh, Summerhill Net Academy on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, YouTube. So um, I, I'm always happy to support these two people who are always happy to support me as well. Um, I, I'm going to finish off here because I don't want to spend too long with, with this work workshop here, but I'd like to first of all thank Anna and Patrick, and I hope that uh, for the audience here, this um, workshop was um, helpful in understanding the difference between CELPIP and um, IELTS, especially IELTS General and CELPIP, which are for permanent residency and citizenship in Canada. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Until next Thank time. <laughs> Until next time. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye.